The following is a special presentation of Higher Journeys and is brought to you in part by the 17th Annual Conscious Life Expo. Visit ConsciousLifeExpo.com to learn more. I am so delighted to have today a brand new guest on Higher Journeys and one that I have the utmost respect for, and that is former Area 51 rocket designer, also referred to as the original rocket man, Mr. David Adair. Welcome, David. Hey, how you doing? Glad to be here. Oh, it's good to have you here. Listen, as I have come to learn a bit more about your work, sir, and your life's journey, I have to tell you, you have got to be the most endearing, engaging storyteller I think I have ever heard. (laughs) I love listening to you. And in fact, you and I had a nice chat. I think it was a week or so ago. And you shared so many interesting tidbits about your journey. And I know that uh, some of what you told me was off the record, but there is one story that you agreed to share with our audience today. And that's how you met and came to know Apollo 11 astronaut Neil Armstrong through his mother, Viola. Would right. you be willing to tell us about that synchronistic coming together and how it impacted your life's path? I think that oh, God. Um, Viola was so much fun to be with. Um, what uh, happened was um, I was always in some kind of um, competition or um, a science fair or some science event. And I was constantly winning things, and I wasn't even trying to compete. But, like, I won from Dow Chemical Company, um, uh, the most innovative chemical formula they ever seen for um, combustion. And I won that, and I beat all these companies, and I'm just a sophomore in high school. Mm. And um, most of my stuff that I won was outside the school system because my school system wasn't ready for anything like this. Yeah. But the point is, um, I'd win, and uh, people would hang medals around my neck or uh, give me a trophy. And when Neil got picked to be the first man on the moon, whether she wanted it or not, Viola Armstrong, his mother, who's a very uh, she was a very Judeo-Christian woman, born again, and um, but was kind of shy, and she was suddenly thrust. I mean, instantly into um, celebrity status. So the state of Ohio, uh, I think it was Governor Gilligan then, he appointed her as a dignitary for the state of Ohio. So because Neil was an astronaut, um, she got shoved over into the the science awards. So after about the fifth or sixth medal she was hanging on my neck, within three months, she just asked me. She stood back, and we started getting to know each other, and she's looking at me because, what are you doing, child? I said, well, I guess I'm a little busy. She goes, I'd say. Uh, she said, why don't you come to my house and visit? And um, I thought, wow, this would be cool. I said, sure. I lived about an hour away by car in Mount Vernon. She was over in Wapakoneta, Ohio, and um, which is on the western side of the state. I was uh, directly dead center. But um, uh, I came over and visited her, and... Man, I we just hit it off. We became just best buds, and um, and she had some uh, project that would almost keep her busy all year long. Uh, see, Armstrong is a German name, so they were a bunch of German immigrants that came to Ohio uh, 100 years back or so, and they uh, were farmers. So they had a co-op, farmers co-op, and in the fall they'd share their crops. And put them all together in these big uh, barns, and then uh, Viola and some of the other women would do canning. Mm-hmm. And this canning process is not where oh, I'll think I'll can a couple hundred yards. Lord, no, they can six or seven or ten thousand yards. <laughs> so I got out there in the barn area where we had stoves, and she taught me to can. So I was doing blanching, warming my lids, <laughs> getting my bottles ready. <laughs> And and it was very mechanical, very much like being in a lab. Yeah. Yeah. That's something I haven't touched, by the way. I love to cook, but I'm like, I don't think I can touch that canning thing. It's very, very, uh, very serious process. It's it's a mechanism. (laughs) And uh, man, I talked to like Dr. Water and she goes, you're really good at this. I went, she only had to show me one time and I got it. And uh, 
So I had my timing charts, and I mean, we're cranking out thousands of jars, you know, in a single week. So um, um, I, I couldn't wait to get over there to do canning with her, especially in the fall. So one day I was uh, coming in the door. Neil came home to visit, and her and Neil were really tight. And um, so I went, hi, Neil. And he goes, mom's out back. I ran right past him in the kitchen, heading toward the barns in the back. And he said, mom's out there in the barns. And I said, okay, Neil. So I'm gone. And uh, Neil was very, uh, very private. He, um, there's so much I can tell you about him. His profile showed that he was a hermit. And when he came back from the moon, what happened to him? He disappeared. Mm-hmm. Uh, he, he really didn't disappear. He was actually teaching physics in Lebanon, Ohio, for the University of Cincinnati. That's where he was. But before he did that, he went to his brothers out in South Dakota, and uh, they were running oil well platforms, and they sold out right before the bust and made a fortune. Hmm. Um, but anyway, um, show you how private Neil is, though. Uh, he sued his barber. He sued his barber because the barber was keeping his hair. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> it pissed Neil off so much. Oh, yeah. But anyway, uh, I ran past Neil, and uh, Viola said to me, uh, David, um, Neil said something to me today. I said, yeah, what did he say? Uh, he said, Mom, I swear if I didn't get out of the way fast enough, I think David would put a footprint on my head to get to you. <laughs> I said, oh, I didn't hurt his feelings or anything, did I? She goes, yeah, well... I think you might want to stop and talk to him for a while next time you come in like that. And I'm sitting there going, how many people would ask you to stop what you're doing and talk to Neil Armstrong? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> and my that. mother could ask it the way she did. And I felt kind of embarrassed, like I was rude. But next time I saw Neil, I sat down and talked to him. Uh, but what Neil told me he liked about me the most, I wasn't there for him, man. I was there for his mother. I said, yeah, that's absolutely right. And he said, being in all the rockets, all the stuff you're doing, everything you think you'd be all over me, but we know you're here for my mother. And I said, yeah, that's exactly right, Neil. And he goes, I love that about you. So we got along well. And um, and I got to know Neil, and I just saw the First Man movie. And um, I had to uh, talk to Jay Matchett. Um, God, now how that Jay Matchett is in my documentary film. Mm-hmm. America's Fall from Space, but um, Jay Matchett is a great, great nephew of Viola. Oh, wow. So, um, mm-hmm. That makes uh, Neil his great, great uncle. So anyway, um, that's really important because what happened when I was doing this documentary, I was sitting here and I had, oh God, it's such a long story. Um, you had to know what was going on with poor Viola and Steph and the father. Stephen just said, heck with it. And he went to Columbus, Ohio and got a job and left poor Viola back at the house. Their house was so packed with gifts from kings and prime ministers and dignitaries of the entire earth. Mm. I mean, you got to be back there at that time period to see what this was like. It was just unbelievable. So this big ranch house type house they had um the, i remember the first floor it was just um we had pathways we walked through to get from room to room you couldn't move <laughs> and i took a minute and stopped and started looking around there was a lunar lander module model that was about three feet wide about two feet tall and that thing was 24 carats solid gold oh my yeah. It must have been a thousand pound chunk of gold carved into this lunar lander thing. And um, and then I looked over at this other thing that came from India, from the uh, their head, uh, the head of state there. And this thing had what looked like, you know, cheap jewelry glued to it. <laughs> and I got closer and I went, that's not glass. That's right. There was emeralds. And rubies and opals, you know, the size of golf balls. Oh, my gosh. And I'm going, so I took a pad and a calculator, (laughs) and I stayed in one quarter of one room. And this was 1969, 19, let's see, it was going into the winter, so almost 1970. But just in one quarter of one room was probably a billion dollars 
and and precious metals, mm -hmm. jewels, and I and Viola's got all this in her house by herself. I hope she had an alarm system. <laughs> they didn't have one. She didn't have one. So I call. I asked her. I said, Viola, you got a lawyer for the family? She goes, Yeah. You got his name and number, and she handed it to me. I got on the phone. Are you the lawyer for uh, Viola Armstrong? Yes, for the family. He said for Stephen and her and the family. Have you been to her house lately? He goes, No. I think you need to get in the car and come over right now. Well, who are you? I'm a canning guy. I can't <laughs> get canning. Yeah. You better take a look at this. And I said, This is a billion dollars worth of, in one room, there's like eight rooms. I said, There's a billion dollars in, in assets here. Hmm. He thought I was out of my mind. So he came over, and when he stepped in the door, he started looking around, and the first thing he picked up was this giant uh, diamond that was about the size of a grapefruit. Oh, my goodness. And oh. I, I looked at him. I said, you got armored cars? You know anybody that's got armored cars? Get them all over here. And he, he, <laughs> after he kind of gathered his wits there, he had no idea this was going on. And right. um, so we sat there, and the first thing he did was call the county sheriff. So they sent armed people over there. And I said, that's a smart move. <laughs> get, get them all over here. By the way, I can feed them. There's all kinds of good stuff in the kitchen. Right. <laughs> and I said, I'll feed them until you get all this out of here. Then the armor cars, uh, Wells Fargo showed up. And they got all the stuff moved to a uh, some kind of um, security vault that was big enough to hold it all. Oh, my gosh. And they had no idea all this was going on. This poor little lady sitting there. I mean, it's a funny story. Yeah, that right? is then, a funny story. Where is this stuff now? Do we know? Do you, oh, yeah. I don't think oh, we yeah. should tell. You can, <laughs> you can go see it. Uh, they oh. put it in a vault and held it till they built the museum for Neil. Oh. And then they moved it all in there. And go look at that museum I would by the it. interstate over there in um, Wapakoneta. But just imagine, all that stuff you see in that museum was set in, about in our house. And we were dodging and moving around it. And it's just a crazy story. But um, It is a crazy story. And it's, well, crazy is one word. Well, Synchronistic is another. But you're, it, it sounds like you're the one to be credited for the fact that it's in that museum right now. <laughs> oh, man. It's just such weird things. Um, I guess that might have been true. But here's what really got me cranked. With the, the point to all this. I was moving stuff with hand trucks along with everybody else. And, um, and they was trying to watch me and the lawyer said, he's not the one to watch. Everybody else you watch. He's the only one you don't have to watch. <laughs> and, um, but Viola handed me this little cigar box and it was made of wood. It's really pretty. And I thought that was a gift, <laughs> the cigar, a wooden cigar box. Oh man, this is really cool. And she said, no, um, uh, open it up. I want you to have what's in it. And I opened it up and I looked at it and I went, <laughs> no, that, that's not what she's supposed to be, right? She said, "Yeah, there's the, yeah, what Neil did. He he had made them so messy. Um, he put the second pair on the suit. These are the vows to his suit that he was walking on the moon. You know, the big uh, red and blue vows that's in the front chest of the spacesuit. Mm -hmm, <laughs> mm -hmm. These are all the vows." Oh, wow. The vows. I said, I can't take this. This is a, it's like a national heirloom. I can't take this. Right. She right. said, yeah, you can. We've already, nobody knows about it. Here, you just take it with you. One day you'll know what to do with it. Hmm. I sat with them things for 44 years. And I have a picture of them on my wall over here. They're on a plaque. Um, I, gl I glued them on a plaque. And, um, and I'm sitting here, and this was like two years ago, I was looking at him, and I'm going, I'm getting old. I'm 65 in January. I said, I'm going to croak. I can't throw these <laughs> things into the landfill. I can't give them to anybody. Can you imagine what happened you post something like that on eBay? <laughs> oh, boy. Well, we talked about that offline, didn't we? Putting interesting things on eBay. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, that would do it. And the first people on the door would be NASA. Yeah. So anyway, see, there's laws. No one can have... Any of those artifacts, even though the astronauts, uh, there are with Neil some exceptions, but the whole uh, trick of it is, it has to be bloodline, you know, like heirlooms with you know being uh, passed down. 
So I, I didn't know what to do with these, and I thought, boy, if Viola really trusted me, I'd do something right with these valves. So um, out of the blue, I get a phone call. And it's this little guy named Jay Matchett, and he tells me he is a great, great nephew. And so we started talking, and he said, uh, the reason I'm calling you is uh, we opened up um, great grandma's um, personal effects, and there's all these letters, stacks and stacks of letters tied in pretty ribbons. And then these letters were important to her. There are letters between you and her. Who are you? The family doesn't oh. know anything about you. I said, that's exactly right, because Viola and I didn't want anybody to know that we were best buddies, because uh, I was being hammered by my own problems with paparazzi, and she had one that was on nuclear steroids. Mm -hmm. So we decided nobody needs to know that we're best friends, except for Neil. Wow. And uh, that's why you don't know about this. Well, here's all the letters we've been reading, and... Um, you know an awful lot about this family. I said, yeah, I way, know way more stories than you guys would want me to know. And, um, hmm. and some of them I just can't tell you because it's so personal about Neil. Yeah. Um, and I promised never to say anything, so I didn't. So he uh, wanted to meet me. I said, well, we're going to be in Mount Vernon, Ohio, filming a documentary. Uh, if you want to meet me, meet me there. So he shows up, and he, uh, we put him in the film. And while he's there, I have my dress coat over the table, and I said, "Yeah, I brought you something. What? Look at this." And I pull the coat back, and there's these valves. And he goes, "Are those the valves of the?" Yeah, man. I, d I don't know what the story is on, but you know, Viola handed them straight to me in the middle of her living room, and uh, he goes, "God, oh my!" And I said, "These are going home with you." Oh. Oh, she are a direct bloodline, and Viola was right. I guess I would figure out what to do with him at the end. So he yeah. starts bawling like crazy right there in the middle of the I'm room. sure. Oh, and, that's uh, beautiful, beautiful. And I give it to him, and um, his sister, who's just cynical as she can be, hmm. said, no, he's going to want something about that. He's going to want something for it. He said, no, Grandma, he just uh, gave him to me. No, he'll be back. He wants something. <laughs> I've never asked for him back, but she's right. There's something I'm going to do. Um, what I'm going to do, I've just met a friend um, who is a 3D manufacturer. So I'm going to have him send those valves back to me, and I'm going to replicate them and then send th those valves back to him, and I'll have them on set. That's a nice thing to do. Yeah, so what I'll a beautiful to... story. What an am <laughs> let, me, let me just say, David, uh, you – have led and are continuing to lead a charmed life <laughs> i am not kidding and i don't say that lightly because it's not just about the stuff you know and all the serendipity associated with these these amazing things that have come from your sojourn but the significance around and behind it there clearly we could go on for days i'm sure as to how this happened how did david adair the original rocket man did you land here in a rocket here <laughs> what, what happened but but Listen, I want to talk, and I so wish we had longer. This is going to be sort of an abbreviated interview today, but we will be uh, hopefully meeting in a, in a couple of months in, in Los Angeles, and we'll do a face-to-face. -face. But I would really love, and by the way, thank you for sharing that with us. I really want to, I want to say thank you uh, for that amazing story. I want to now move on to what I like to call the dreamscape, the dreamscape. Dreams, no doubt, have, have played a major role in informing you with absolutely mind-blowing and critical knowledge, information that probably couldn't be obtained in thousands of hours of course study, even if you tried. I, I know a lot of people know your story, and we, we just got right into this conversation. We will make sure to have a bio if people are not familiar with your work, but I have a feeling many in our audience are. So I'm just going to dive right in. Uh, you're obviously an accomplished um, inventor and builder of rockets and beyond. And again, it were the dreams that you said began at 12 really started that uh, set you on a course. I, I'd love for you to tell us about that process, how this all started for you uh, of obtaining knowledge through dreams and how they would inform the many ideas you brought forward and were able to, to bring to fruition. Join us for the 17th Annual Conscious Life Expo, February 22nd through the 25th in Los Angeles. This is the largest consciousness event of its kind, with 200 exhibitors and over 150 lectures, workshops, and special events. Hear from leading speakers and teachers, including Marianne Williamson, David Wilcock, Anita Morjani, Nassim Harriman, Eric Von Daniken, Linda Moulton Howe, and Deborah King. Visit ConsciousLifeExpo.com to secure your 
your place for the transformational event of the year. Yeah, it, well, it started on a, on, well, I got out of school for the summer. And um, that's always a good time for kids. And um, it was the first week. And it was a really warm summer night. And I don't know, I just felt like, you know, premonition, whatever you want to call it. Just had a feeling about, you know, like something's coming. I just don't know what. It's like a big old truck you hear in the distance. Mm-hmm. And uh, you can just hear it rumbling out there. But I could feel or hear something. And um, went to bed that night. And um, what it, it first started off was... Um, I thought it was just a barrage of numbers and meaningless expressions, just stuff you see in a dream. But then I noticed uh, an apparatus that was with it that I could see. And that apparatus is called um, a calorimetry of horsepower. It's a calorimetry tester. Um, It's how we can determine um, between horsepower and thrust. Uh, There's a number of things you can do with this device. But I noticed that the numbers that was coming off this calorimetry testing was way beyond anything normal. Um, it's, it's in a 100 million degrees centigrade range. That's about 10,000 times hotter than the core of the sun. Hmm. So whatever this is working on, man, that is some serious uh, BTUs, to say the least, <laughs> uh, British thermal units. But so... I didn't really make much sense. I woke up and I couldn't remember any of it. I just remember I had some strange mathematical goulash go by. And um, so I was telling my mother all about it. She said, do you remember any of it? I said, not right now. Um, I woke up. I remember waking up and right sitting up in the bed for a few minutes. And I could see it clearly then. And then I went back to bed and went back to sleep, and um, then it's gone. So my mother, she takes my lamp next to my bed and strips the wires off of the, makes a neutral ground and ties the other hot ends on the other end. And what it allowed that lamp to do, this is um, 1966. You touch the lamp and it comes on. Touch it, it goes off. <laughs> my mother made the first touch lamp, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard mother, you tell that story. My mother was such a tinker that I don't mind. She's always doing stuff like that. I think it runs in the family. That's another yeah, thing. Yeah, my dad. Oh, my dad in mechanics is just un, un, wow. unimaginable. Um, but anyway, I said, dang, Mom, I think that's a patent. <laughs> <laughs> Did you really? <laughs> she just blew it off. Said, We're not in staff. We just need a light that's easy to turn on and off. <laughs> yeah, but that's, you know, she said, no, here's what you got to focus on. So she gave me a big artist pad, and all I had to do was lean over and touch the base of the lamp comes on, and I'm to write down, doesn't matter where on the pad, just write everything down you can remember. And I said, yeah, we'll see how that goes. So I had another, that's, dreams came again next, the second night. Here they are coming. So I started writing stuff down. Wake up next morning, can't remember, you know, for anything, just looks like what I remember was just scrambled. I looked down at the pad, and as soon as I saw these things, man, everything jumped right into place. I mean, at the speed of thought. Wow. And I went, oh, man, this helps. So I was able to rewrite all the fillers in between, which is your actual uh, structuring of your of this kind of math with all the different algorithms and all the different um, variables. Uh you know, it's like trying to remember the exact curve, all the curves that's inside of Mobius. Mm-hmm. Um, but with this pad, I was able to, as soon as I started writing more of it down onto a, a journal I could carry, when I was rewriting it, all this other stuff came in, I remembered. So it really is quite instrumental. And so I went back, you know, and go to bed the third night, and it starts up again. And this mm-hmm. is, Another weird thing, the dreams or whatever it is, I'm dreaming in in absolute consecutive order. Mm -hmm. It'd be like dreaming reading a book and you stop 
on a certain page, and then when you go back to bed and dream again, you start off exactly you where you left. You pick up, right. We talked about that offline. I think that is something. I yeah. just don't have an explanation for that. But, you know, how, did, how does that work? Yeah. And, let, let, I'm gonna, I want to ask you something. Forgive me for, for, for chiming in a bit. But th again, this you could just make a, a conversation out of this, just this process. And you and I did talk about this offline, about this, I, this notion of time being measured differently from wh whatever you are communicating with. And I, I would like to ask you, where do you think this knowledge is coming from? And then maybe we can talk a little bit about uh, the, the construct of time or working outside of time in this case is where the stream of information, how the stream of information was picking well, up with no at time. The time yeah. At the time, there was just probably not even a hundred books worldwide written on this stuff. Mm. And I got to read them all because um, of a little old lady, <laughs> Mrs. Hunt, Barbara Hunt. And um, she was about 80 years old when <laughs> I first met her. She's a librarian, and she's watching me read the books. And I always stayed in one corner over in the six to eight hundred section, and that's all the science books. So I always sat on the floor because I didn't want to take a table away from an adult. So um, uh, she came over and she asked me, "Are you reading these books?" And I didn't mean to sound smart, Alec, but I told her I said. Well, there's no pictures in them. <laughs> and she goes, <laughs> and uh, I guess that could have been rude, but she um, <laughs> said, how much do you remember these books? All of it. <laughs> what do you mean all of it? Everything that's in the books. And how many books do you remember? All of them. Well, how many have you read here? All of them. Mm -hmm. That's about 500 books. And um, so she reaches over top of me. She grabs this book. She opens up and says, well, tell me what's on this page. Can you give me the title of the book? That would help. <laughs> and she said, um, yeah, whatever this thing means. She goes, it's uh, something called a singularity into momentum. And I went, oh, yeah. Um, she said, let me open to the pre. What? Well, what's the introduction of the book? And I said, there, okay, hold on. Oh, um, in this book, we will learn about the singularity of a collapse of a star, whether it will turn into a neutron or a pulsar, depends on which way the star will go. That will, in turn, will determine which way the density of the star. And she said, stop. <laughs> and she, she slams the book shut and puts it on the shelf. She said, uh, are there other books out there you know of? I said, oh, yeah. But I'm in, you know, we're in the West Virginia coal fields. Yeah. So, um. Uh, I'm not going to have any luck. Actually, at, no, at this moment, we're in Centerburg, Ohio. My parents moved. And, um, and you know, in the cornfields of Ohio, nobody's going to have books like that. Right. But she said, I want you to come back at 6 o'clock in the evening. There's a meeting of the librarians. I said, yeah. Um, I'm going to, I want you to join the librarians. You become a librarian. I said, it's all girls, right? I said, I can't do that. <laughs> it's like trying to become, uh, getting enrolled in the home economics. <laughs> um, she said, I'll swing it. And then when uh, I stayed at the meeting, did everything, and signed me on, the girls were nice, and um, got along well with them. And then she, before I went out the door, she goes, you are aware that one of the perks for a librarian, you can order as many books as you want from all over the world. For yourself. Uh, for yourself. I wow. said, really? Now you're a librarian. <laughs> oh, man. Did oh, that man. woman have little idea of what a monster she turned loose? <laughs> uh, I could have every book there ever was. Mm -hmm. And that's how I got to know what was written at the time in the area of... Um, it's more than quantum physics. It's, um, it's where you work with singularities and um, mm -hmm. collapse of stars. It's... it's uh, electromagnetic fusion containment is where mm -hmm. I was ultimately going. Mm -hmm. And um, do you some, I learned something. Millennials, they do not like big, long technical terms. They have a tendency to shorten it down real quick. And they did not like my electromagnetic fusion containment engine. And so now they shorten it down to something which is, I think is fabulous, what they call it. Which Technically is. accurate, but very cool. 
they call my engine a star in a jar. Star in a jar. And I, <laughs> I thought you were going to give me an acronym. Star in a jar. Well, it rhymes. Yeah, star no, in a jar. Exactly it's catchy. What, it's beautiful. That's because what it is is an electromagnetic containment field holding the nuclear chain reaction of whatever atoms you're working with. Basically, you're containing an H bomb inside a magnetic bottle. So Yikes. they are so correct when they say a star in a jar. That's that's uh, that's another form of brilliance with these millennials and other ways <laughs> of how they've changed our lexicon around. But it's catchy, yeah. that's for sure. Because listen, I won't lie, you you are over my head in terms of the uh, certainly the science associated with the the brilliant work that you're doing. But I, I think the the implications for what it is you're working. I I don't know if we won't have time to go into that today. But you told me some things offline about some things to come that I think we'll all. Uh, be afforded uh, to seeing <laughs> having to do with the moon may I say maybe maybe can I put just put that little out there is that okay or do I need to scrap that from the broadcast <laughs> no no um, <laughs> I'm not gonna have I, you... <laughs> there's stuff going on with the moon has been for millenniums but yeah. uh, the way they have they being NASA has uh, banned everybody from really looking at areas and um, I came across a videotape thing that's titled Moon Bases. And I thought, well, let's look at this. And what it is, uh, these people are so anal retentive. They have poured over every NASA photo NASA ever took of the moon. And I mean, they have looked at every, you know, milliliter of, the, of those prints. And honest God, they have come up with stuff I cannot explain. Hmm. But it's there. And you can even see where NASA's tried to airbrush it. And uh, they were able to remove that. And what's left is like, what is that? Hmm. There's an arch up there that's hundreds of times bigger than the arch of St. Yeah. Louis. And I don't know what it is. What is that? I have a feeling and, you're going to find out. Yeah. <laughs> you're so, going to find out. So, and then we're told we can't go back to those areas, you know. Mm. For a long time, people were even willing to do fun drives and build their own, uh, you know, explorer robot to go to these areas and look at them, and, and they were denied. No, you're not going to do that. Mm. And that's when that started annoying me because I thought, hey, anybody's got a right to look at stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, find out, no, you don't have rights. If they, uh, apparently, NASA didn't want you to see that. So, yeah. I've been knowing all this for decades and working on my own stuff, and uh, uh, but here recently, and I mean within the last few months, uh, and this is neat. Uh, do you know Serena Wright? Taylor. Taylor. Yes, and, I do. Oh. From the Conscious Life Expo, it's a perfect segue because that's what we're going to be closing with. Yes, I do. Yeah. <laughs> well, that little girl, that lady, she um, she's the only witness <laughs> to this whole event. And I told her, don't disappear. You're the only person that saw this. She got the emails first. Hmm. There was this group of people looking for me from the Mideast. And they knew that I was going to be talking there at their event. So they contacted her through an email. And they told her, when she first told me, she goes, she goes what is it with you, David? You just draw stuff like this? I said, <laughs> they said that they have all the funding for me to reconstruct my uh, engine, which... Um, that's going to be interesting in itself, but they had funding for everything. I said, um, you know, and they would like to get hold of me. So she sends the emails on to me. And she said, well, gosh, David, I guess, what are you going to do? I said, well, I guess I'll contact them. <laughs> so it's a group of people that um, are out in the Mideast. They are primarily located in Cairo, Egypt, <laughs> of all places. Mm -hmm. And um, I think what it is, is it's a bunch of the royal families. And um, they're they're putting together some kind of vast project out there. And they're building it right now. And uh, they want me to come and look at it and see everything and, and basically join them. And they have enough funding for my engine and some of my projects. And I said, you know, you're talking hundreds of billions of dollars mm -hmm. and they said yeah where would you like to fund sent and uh let me come and visit you and see what you got going on 
Okay. Now, have so, you been over? Have you been over yet for the visit, or you're you're? No, just... they're still building my house. Oh my gosh! No, they're building me. <laughs> and I thought, it's boy, really... we're probably going to end up living in a tent in the desert, and um, I don't think so. It's will <laughs> be a little uh... bit more uh, polished than I thought. You'll love Cairo. I've been there on a, a, a couple of occasions, and it's uh, it's quite well, the, the city of Cairo, of course, is uh, like many major cities, but there's a lot of everything over there. The tents yeah, as well as the sky, the skyscrapers. <laughs> but it's a beautiful place, actually. Well, yeah. I mean, of all people on the planet to want to fund me, to um, they asked me what I wanted to do, and I want to go back to the moon. Mm. I want to go back to the forbidden areas of the moon, and I want to find out what's going on up there. And was there somebody there? Did we did we get run off? I don't know, but I'm gonna want to go find out. Mm. And um, so. Anyway, it seemed to plug or resonate with these people, so it's just ironic that of all people on the planet, <laughs> it'll be the Egyptians. I'll be wow. Well, well it, yeah, it's, going it's back a to reason. the moon. Yeah, amazing. Yeah. Well, all I ask is that you don't go until you make your appearance <laughs> at the Conscious Life Expo. I'm going to use right. that as a segue because we get to shut this down. It. Oh my gosh. Now, folks out in the Higher Journeys audience, you must know that we did not just start talking when you've heard when you heard the beginning of the show. We have been on for I think probably an hour prior to to yeah. our going on the air. And and David, don't hang up because we got to say a proper goodbye, which okay. could be another hour. But <laughs> listen, <laughs> I want to invite everyone to be sure to visit ConsciousLifeExpo.com to learn more about David's talk. You can get some information about that if if he hangs out long enough. He may be in Cairo by the time the <laughs> conference. I have a feeling you'll make it to the expo. You better. <laughs> Serena, well, I, I, Serena will be very upset, and so will I. So, <laughs> well, I'll promise I'll be there if I have to use their jet and fly there back. There you go. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> or you may have to build a rocket for yourself to do it even quicker. So, and I'm, I'm sure you can you. pull that off. <laughs> you know, that's that's the thing that, that that's a good point to take off on. Um, people really think um, that you know I'm a rocket scientist. That's really not true. Um, I know a lot about rockets <laughs> more than the average person, mm -hmm. and I've built an awful lot of them. But that's not what that was not what I was after. Um, what I was doing, as a matter of fact, uh, an old friend um, was looked at my work mathematically, and he was so smart by the, his questions. I could tell how smart he was. But he was looking at uh, the same uh, expressions that I was writing to try to get the, the thing figured out. And he said to me, he said, um, what medium are you using? I said, uh, rocket engines. He went, oh, how, did, how, you, how are you able to contain the fields? And I went, boy, this guy is really smart. I can't. That's the problem. But what I was doing, um, I'm using rocket engines to validate the theory of the hypothesis of con fusion containment. So I'm trying to build a new power system. Actually, it's an old power system that's been around forever, but we haven't chose to use it because it's very complicated to work with. Uh, there are two cousins in the nuclear world. One is good, one is bad. You, the only ones y'all have known is the bad cousin. Mm -hmm. That's the ones with atomic fission and the type of uh, fusion that we, they're using. Not fusion containment, just fusion. So the problem with those two designs, you're going to have horrible waste that depend on what fuel you're using, uranium, plutonium, um, beryllium, whatever it is, um, Half-life could be as much as 30,000 years, so you throw something out on the ground 20-some thousand years later, it still kills you in minutes. That's a horrible waste uh, to try to manage and ha handle. That's why they put it all in Yucca Mountain, mm -hmm. and now they've moved it again. But, um, and then the other one, fission, is even worse. It's just so dirty and nasty, and you can make nuclear fuel with the waste uh, that it puts out, and the things can get overheated of the big pile rods and you go into uh, a meltdown which uh, they call China syndrome it'd be so hot mm -hmm. it can melt the earth right um, but it won't do that because they'll hit the cold earth and blow backwards 
uh, up into the atmosphere, covering everything, and that was called Chernobyl. Yes. And mm -hmm. now you've got four Chernobyls burning right now called Fukushima. And um, you got such problems there. It, you know, everybody thinks they got it all fixed because we quit seeing it on TV. <laughs> Wrong answer. Mm -hmm. They're still burning just as they were when you last saw them on TV. Yeah. Have yeah. been. They're pumping That's... the entire Pacific Ocean. Yeah. That's been said. The, uh, mm -hmm. Through the thing. Uh, you can't even eat yellowfin tuna anymore. It's banned worldwide. Their mm -hmm. little glands absorb enough radiation. They're no oh. longer edible. So um, oh. I hope the bluefin tuna keeps on going. Right, right. But, uh, you know, that's been that's been talked about that it's been hushed, you know, yeah, after it came out of the, the the public awareness. It, it that doesn't has nothing to do with the fact that it uh, has gone anywhere. It's gotten worse, if anything. All so. four of those, yeah, all four yeah. of those reactors are averaging a thousand redkins an hour. Wow, that's really that's so hot that would melt your skeleton in a day. Oh boy, yeah. So they're trying well, to build uh, robots now that will go in there and allow them to get to access where they can start repairing things and shut them down. But um, that's a horrible situation y'all got going there. Well, let's end on an up note. We got to shut this down right now. So what you got positive for us? Because we're not leaving it there. Okay. No, <laughs> T uh, tell us what you'll be talking about at the expo in February, very briefly. Well, um, everybody's got to hear my story. Yes. I don't know why. It's like some kind of mecca thing for them. They, they make a pilgrimage to hear my story. But... Um, the other thing, I'm going to talk about the moon, okay. um, and there's also, um, uh, I talked about it last time, it was the space shuttle program you did not get to see. Um, there's so much of the space shuttle program y'all not aware of. Uh, it was shut off by NASA, and the prime contractors like Rockwell International, Martin Marietta, uh, Allison Grumman. Um, they all had these really elaborate business plans, and um, it's a long story. They gave them to me. What a story that is in itself. But anyway, um, there are products that could have been made out there with the space shuttles. And just to show you the madness of it all, and you can't explain it, would you buy a car and only drive it 34% of its life and then throw it in the junkyard? Of course not. That's what you did with the entire shuttle fleet. Yeah. Every yeah. shuttle, every shuttle that went into a museum had 66% of its life left, and you shoved them all to a museum, and the morons would tell us, "Time to celebrate and party." <laughs> For what? You just mothballed the space fleet. You got a hundred and fifty billion dollar platform called the International Space Station flying over your head, and you've got no way to get to it now, unless you hitch a ride with a very irritable world leader named Putin. It depends on how he feels about it. Uh, I did, I'm going to have to hug him when I meet him, though, because um, he told NASA off really good. He said, told NASA that next time you want to get to the ISS, try a trampoline. <laughs> <laughs> the man just bitch slapped NASA. Oh, <laughs> my gosh. In front of the world. And I thought, man, I want to hug that guy. Yeah. But, well, uh, I, I have a feeling you will do just that and more, David and Tara. <laughs> Yeah. Listen, we are going to have to wind it down for now, but I, this will be continued, folks, to be sure. This will be continued. I think we just made a deal. We're going to be doing something on camera in Los Angeles in February. And, uh, you know, there's a lot more to hear from David Adair. So just want to thank you for joining us today, Mr. Adair. And don't hang out because I got a couple more questions for you. I'm going to ask offline. Sure. In the meantime, thanks, everyone, for joining us for this edition, this special edition of Higher Journeys Radio. Take good care. <laughs>